What I'd like to do is have us go through the principles of human knowledge, which won't take as much time, and this will hopefully answer some of your questions about Barclay, and as we have time at the end, I will gladly answer all of your questions and objections. As you can imagine, Barclay's got an answer for everything. Um, and I know he's one of my favorite philosophers. I know his philosophy inside and out. So you think you've got an objection to him at the end, I'd love to see if you're right. Just ask you, do you think he's like got something, or do you think he's a complete kook? Oh, I wouldn't call him a complete kook, but he's, uh, he's wrong. He's wrong. I can demonstrate he's wrong. <laughs> if, you, if you want a demonstration of, of what's wrong with him, maybe we, I can do that for you uh, next week if we've got time. Uh, yeah. Um, but man, is this good. Um, <laughs> so, let's go turn the clock back three years earlier than what you just went over. Um, what we're going to be doing in here is one way to see what L Barclay is doing, and people who like Locke would hate this, but he's basically taking Locke's empiricism to its logical ends. Like he's, he takes Locke's principles and says, Locke, you weren't consistent. Here is the most consistent way to do this. Um, he denies the existence of matter and material substances, and he thinks that that is actually the source of skepticism and atheism. You might say, but I thought he's a skeptic. He is not. He defends an empiricist version of immaterialism. If you think about this, Leibniz gave you an immaterialist view of reality. Leibniz thought monads, remember those little guys? They were the most fundamental units of reality. But those monads are not material things. The difference is Leibniz was a rationalist. Leibniz thought all of no all the knowledge of the universe is contained in every single monad. So there's no need for experience really to inform those little monad guys, including you. Barclay thinks the, that everything is immaterial, but that, that he thinks you still need experience, that experience is the key to uh, knowing things about the universe. Um, and finally, B Barclay thinks that his view is a better way of thinking about, of understanding the ordinary ways in which we talk. Whereas he thinks Locke's ways, as we've already seen in the dialogue, are not suitable to ordinary ways of speaking. So he begins with empiricism in section one. Um, and if you have your book open to this, you can see um, in section one of part one, so starting on 447, he talks about knowledge coming from three sources. It can be imprinted on the senses, it can be perceived by attending to the passions and operations of the mind, or you can form new ideas with the help of memory and imagination. These three principles should sound just like stuff you heard from Locke. All of your ideas come through experience, either internal or external, and that you can form new ideas only by reflecting and reimagining the ideas you've already acquired. So that's his starting point, which is the same starting point that Locke had. He goes on at the end of section one to talk about what he thinks of as objects. Objects, according to Barclay, are nothing but collections of ideas. He says, as several of these are observed to accompany each other, they come to be marked by one name, and so to be re reputed as one thing. He gives an example of an apple. What is an apple, according to Barclay? An apple is just what you experience. It is the bundling of several ideas. The, the idea of its color, of its shape, of its taste, of its smell, of the way it feels. The apple is nothing more than a collection of ideas, a collection of sensations, and nothing more. Locke said that the apple was not really those things you experience in sensation. The apple was some other thing you cannot have any direct perception of, that causes you to have the ideas. Barclay says, no, the apple is nothing more than a collection of ideas. So if you were to ask Barclay, well, doesn't he think the book exists? Doesn't he think the table exists? Doesn't he think trees exist? He says, yeah, I think they all exist. 
I think they exist as collections of ideas. But I don't think they exist as matter, whatever that's supposed to be. The other thing that, it, in addition to ideas, there are spirits or minds that perceive ideas and will to do things. So he believes that there are some things that are not ideas. These are the things that have ideas. And the only reason why we believe they exist is because we have a direct awareness of them because we are a spirit. We are a mind. A mind is not an idea, but it's that thing that perceives ideas. You need to have minds in order for there to be ideas. You can't just have ideas out there doing nothing, hanging out on their own. Ideas need to be perceived to exist. So you need perceivers. And that's all that exists in Barclay's world. Barclay thinks the only things that exist are ideas and then minds that perceive them. And we're going to talk about more about spirits at the very end. In the third section, he introduces his principle that is very important. In Latin, esse es percipi. To be is to be perceived. And what he's trying to say in this is that the essence of what it means to exist as an object is to be perceived. And he gives kind of this short argument in that section. Objects are nothing more than collections of ideas. The essence of ideas is to be perceived. You can't have ideas apart from a perceived perception of them. Therefore, the essence of objects is to be perceived. Here's one of the main arguments he's going to raise against matter. He says that matter is a contradictory notion. Objects, as he says, are nothing more than collections of our ideas about them. But matter is supposed to be something that we cannot perceive, and it's supposed to be something that can exist apart from perception. So here's the challenge if you believe in matter. How can something... How can an idea, that is, how can we have an idea of something we cannot perceive? So how do you have the idea of what matter is if you can't perceive what matter is? You might say, but wait a minute, I do perceive matter. I do perceive, like, the, the surface of this desk. You don't perceive matter, you perceive color. Or you perceive the feeling when you touch it. But matter is not supposed to be the color or the touch or if you get desperate and taste it, it's not the taste. And the matter is supposed to be something else which you don't perceive that is supposed to have those qualities, but is different from the qualities. Didn't um, Locke say we get like perceptions like that through reflection? So then he's going to say, we're going to get into this a little bit, but he's going to. Barclay's point is, what Locke is trying to say that we infer for one, there's no grounds for the inference, and secondly, this thing is, con is internally contradictory. It's like Locke is saying, and then there are round circles. Barker is about a round circle, that's contradictory. Matter is in just as bad shape. The main argument for this is in section 23, which I will not read, but here is the way that we can think about this argument. If material objects exist, then material objects are supposed to exist independently of anyone's thinking about them. If material objects exist independently of any minds thinking about them, then it is conceivable for material objects to exist without any mind thinking of them. But in the third claim here, here's the rub. It is not the case that you can conceive of a material object without thinking of it. Can you think of something that exists apart from thought? You might say, yeah, easily. Like, I can imagine my shoes right now that I left in my closet at home, and nobody's there. So they exist, but they're not being perceived. But I say, wait a minute. You're thinking about them right now, aren't you? What I want you to do is come up with an idea you have of something that is not in anyone's mind. But what's going to happen? Anytime you say something, guess what you're doing? You're going to be thinking about it. 
Since you can't conceive of a material object without thinking about it, it follows that it is not the case that a material object can exist independently of you thinking about it, which means it's not the case that a material object can exist. If you have these three claims, everything else just follows as a matter of logic. Yeah? So like if you walked out of the room, these, like everything in here just doesn't exist anymore if you're not thinking about it? That's one possibility. Maybe when we stop, if we all stop perceiving something, it just might completely go out of existence. The other option that maybe is more palatable for Barclay and maybe for you is maybe there is a mind that perceives all things. Maybe God perceives everything all the time. And if God perceives everything all the time, that's how it stays in existence. I think, I'm a little bit confused. So, if at least one person is thinking of it, it exists? Is that what you're saying? So, what if everyone stopped thinking of it, but then started thinking of it again? Would it, like, go in and out of existence? If literally everyone did that, yes. Okay. Which might include God. So, if you could get God to participate, <laughs> yeah. Another important argument he makes against matter, this was the question about Julius Caesar we didn't get to in the dialogue, is that he says in section 8, an idea can only be like an idea. Think about this. Like a, a picture of something can only be like the visual representation of something. You can't have like a picture of something that's like the sound of something. Or you can't have um, the taste of something isn't like the shape of something. An idea can only be like another idea. So, when you buy into this principle, then how is it possible that our ideas about material objects, how could they be about, how could they resemble or, or be like anything that's not an idea? Supposedly matter, right? If you believe in matter, you don't think matter is an idea. You think matter exists independent of your ideas. So, if an idea can only be like an idea, then our ideas would not, it wouldn't be possible for them to be like matter. And he says, I appeal to anyone, whether it makes, a sen makes sense to assert a color is like something which is invisible, hard or soft like something which is intangible, and so all the rest. If matter is supposed to be colorless, tasteless, odorless, but all of our ideas about objects are filled with color, <coughs> taste, and odor, how is it that our ideas resemble matter? They can't. This is the argument we just went over in three dialogues, that primary qualities cannot exist from apart from secondary ones. So all of the ideas that we would, most of these primary qualities that we think, that Locke got you to think exist apart from perception, you can't think of any of those qualities existing apart from these secondary qualities that you think only exist in mind. So like motion and figure, <coughs> you can't imagine something being in motion or having some shape apart from having color or possibly touch in the shape of motion. Um, number is going to be relative to one's perspective or the unit of one's measure. Um, the same arguments that prove secondary qualities exist only in the mind also prove that primary qualities exist because the, the, sec the primary qualities cannot be separated from the secondary ones. You can't come up with like a pure idea of a primary quality without filling that also with secondary ones. And since all the secondary ones only exist in the mind, on then it must follow the primary ones only exist in the mind too. On things existing outside your mind, um, I have an odd example. A few weeks ago, I, I hit my head on, on one of the trees on campus, and I wasn't thinking about it. So it, and then I hit my head, and then I thought about it. So it existed independent of my mind before I thought about it. Isn't That's that right. An objection you make? Only if you think you are the author of reality. What if the what if rea the author of reality is independent of you, and he causes you to have ideas? So God is going to be the cause of that. 
Um, he thinks that this idea of... Wow, I have so many typos in these. I'm sorry. <laughs> incoherence of substratum. He thinks that substratum is an incoherent idea of what would it mean for there to be a substance that holds qualities but is not itself a quality. Um, and he wants to say, how is it possible for a substance to support or hold qualities if it's not itself another quality? Um, Locke says, well, substances are these things that possess qualities but are not a quality. And Barclay just can't wrap his mind around how that's even possible. Um, I'm going to skip that because that's a little more abstract for the moment. Um, in these sections, he goes on to talk about, suppose there is matter. If there is matter, you couldn't figure it out through experience, that's what he means by sense, or reason. You can't infer that just through what we know. So, why can't we infer the existence of matter from our ideas? It's because it's possible that we might have all the ideas we have now, even if there was no matter. If you think about it, if, you, if we're dreaming right now, you could have all the ideas that you're having right now without any matter causing you to have those ideas. So, you don't need matter to cause you to have these ideas. You can have these ideas even if no matter existed whatsoever. So for that reason, there's no necessary connection between the existence of material objects and the ideas you possess. Um, there's also no probable inference that you can make from your ideas to the existence of matter. Um, and part of this is due to some of his skeptical concerns. Um, probably going to skip reading section 19 here. Um, if you want to look at section 19 on this, you may. Um, on, and we can revisit this um, at the start of next class if you like. All of this then is supposed to t turn to then, all right, then what is the cause of our ideas? How do we get all these thoughts? I mean, like Alex said, things happen to me that I to which I have no control over, um, how does he explain that? First, he says ideas are not the cause of our ideas. That's because ideas are passive and inert in themselves. They're not agents. Figure, extension, and motion are all ideas, so they can't be the cause of our ideas. So, if only, so the only things that exist are ideas and agents. Ideas are not the cause of our ideas. So it must be caused by some kind of active substance, like mind or spirit. Who's that going to be? Um, it's going to be God. He talks about spirits and how we know them. Um, I'm going to skip over this and get to God. Oh, wait. We don't get God yet, because we only have up to section 33. He thinks that God is the cause of our ideas. That God is the only kind of spirit that is powerful enough and smart enough to know all things and to cause each one of us to have coherent, orderly perceptions of reality. So, he's, if you say, but if all that it means to exist is to be perceived, how do you distinguish the reality of dreams, for instance, from the realities of this kind of existence? He says that the difference is you can look at it in, at least in a few different ways. One is that you can talk about it in terms of does the existence depend upon my willing it to be? When you're like daydreaming or remembering something, those ideas are caused by your will. You conjure them up at your choice. And the minute that you stop thinking about them, they stop existing. But there are other ideas that come to you against your will. And those ideas, he says, must then be pressed upon you by some more powerful agent or mind, God. Um, and he says that the perceptions of reality, those are ones that are more steady, orderly, and coherent than the random ideas that are temporarily conjured up by human imaginations. I mean, if you think about this, the fact that reality is one nice, coherent, orderly picture is a proof that whatever is causing reality must be a supremely intelligent being. 
And the fact that he can force these ideas upon me without, against my will must prove that this other intelligent being must be very powerful, more, way more powerful than I am. So, we got a couple minutes. What are your questions or your comments, your insults, your objections about uh, With the group presented uh, by Dr. Berkeley, you got a, a doctorate a doctor in divinity? Yep. Is that theology? Yep. Okay. He was an Anglican minister and believed, he wrote several books about Christianity and was a preacher. And he thought all this was consistent with Christianity. <laughs> Yeah. I'm going to do my best. <laughs> so I'm definitely going to have this test graded. Yeah. And my hope is to have your paper graded before the final as well, so that you, so that you will be able to make that judgment if you want to take the final. Okay. All right. <laughs>